everybody knows that our global economy is absolutely filled with inequality. But what we're going to look at today is why. Okay, so let's talk about inequality and how our economy tends to make it worse rather than smoothing it out. So first, we all know that some people are paid more than others. We also know that some people own a bunch of land and some don't. And yes, some people inherit huge fortunes and other people don't. And in our day-to-day -day lives, we tend to accept that some people own businesses while most of us just have to work for these people, even if they're total jerks. But also, when we take a hard look at just who seems to own everything, there are some pretty obvious patterns of race, gender, and other social categories. How, though, did we get here? Just how does this global economy work, and why are there so many fundamental inequalities? The answer to this is really important, not just for understanding the economy, but also many of our social, political, and environmental problems, too. And that's why this video sort of kicks off our whole series of how people are trying to create social change. Okay. So where to start so we can understand this whole economy of ours? Well, let's start with the fact that what we have today is frequently called capitalism. But just what does that mean? First, we have to recognize that capitalism is just one way of organizing an economy. While it is widespread today, at one point in history it didn't exist, and it is still not necessarily the only way that economies work in some parts of the world today. So capitalism developed from a hodgepodge of other ways of producing and distributing stuff, such as feudalism, slavery, local scale communal sharing economies, and systems where people basically handed over tribute to despots. But to understand how capitalism works today, let's first take a look at how it got going in the first place. So as the story goes, once upon a time, you might have had a community of people who made different kinds of things. And of course, some folks were better at making some things, so they might specialize a bit. In this quaint town of yesteryear, Ms. Squirrel had her wheat farm and made flour. Mr. Pig had some cows and produced milk. And let's say I had some chicken to make eggs. Because, you know, despite what the Easter Bunny may have implied to you, rabbits can't actually lay eggs, I do need these chickens. So anyway, let's say you are Miss Squirrel and you would like to make some pancakes this morning. Well, if you've ever made pancakes, or if you've ever just read the Eric Carl classic book, Pancakes, Pancakes, you know you're gonna need a few ingredients. So in this example, we'll pretend our friends have baking powder, syrup, and other things, but they'll need to trade for the major ingredients that they don't have. We now have this magical moment where economic circulation comes into being. These resources that people have are now commodities, things that can be bought, sold, or traded for other things. Since we are back in the day, however, our animal friends don't have money, so they exchange things directly. We call this CC exchange, or commodity for commodity exchange, or barter. So I have to bring some eggs over to Piggy and Squirrel and trade some eggs for some wheat and some milk. So we have a functioning economy here with circulation and exchange between different producers, but it's a bit cumbersome and messy. I mean, you can probably tell that we could run into some problems here. What if Mr. Pig or Ms. Squirrel don't want eggs today? I'm basically out of luck. Also, carrying around eggs all day uh, to see who might want them, that might be a little bit messy. So this is where money comes in handy. Some type of commodity starts being used as a means of exchange or, simply put, money. Let's say, for instance, that Mr. Cat here has been mining gold and people value it for its unique properties, they like how it's small, it fits in your pocket, it doesn't spoil, it doesn't break like my eggs when you accidentally drop them. So if people start using this one commodity, in this example gold, or some other form of money, which of course there have been many, um, or also if people use some sort of system of credit where you just keep track of who's been given what, you now have an entirely different kind of economy you have now what's known as CMC exchange, or commodity, which you sell for money, which you then use to buy some other commodity, right? 
Now there are some huge advantages of CMC over CC. Not only does the invention of some medium of exchange mean you don't have to carry eggs around everywhere, it also means you can get something from someone even if they don't want what you have. So in this example, Mr. Pig and Ms. Squirrel may not want eggs today, but if Mr. Cat wanted a bunch of eggs last week and I sold to him, well, now I can go get milk and flour to make pancakes today. So of course this CMC process is one that's very familiar to all of us today. When we buy or sell things these days, we usually translate them into dollars or euros or yen or some other form of money that functions as a means of exchange in the process. To, there is, however, one last critical piece of the puzzle for understanding what we call capitalism today. Okay, focus in folks, because this is where it starts to get interesting. So we have this CMC system where you can make commodities, exchange them for money, and then buy commodities. And you can imagine how this new system of exchange can lead to some inequalities, even if small ones. So let's say that Mr. Pig's milk is a big hit, and there aren't many competitors around, and his milk commands high prices, and he gets a nice little nest egg of money that's bigger than some of his neighbors. Some folks who did this realized that this new money economy can work in two ways. First, you can stick with CMC and buy a bunch of stuff. But some folks come up with a different idea. What if we flip it around and turn CMC into MCM? This simple equation is really the essence of what we today call capitalism. What does it mean? Well, it means we start with money, we use it to produce a commodity, and end up with more money at the end. This is why we usually write this as MCM prime. The prime lets us know that the point is to end up not just with money at the end, but with more money at the end. So let's look at how this works. So there are two big pieces to this process. The first is production, taking money to make a commodity. It is very important to note here that at some level, if you're trying to turn money into more money, you don't necessarily care all that much about just what the commodity is, because it's only a means to an end. If your interest is just in turning money into more money, you don't have to produce something you care about or love, just something you can successfully convert into more money. Let's say that Mr. Pig decides to take the money he's amassed from selling his milk and make furniture. So in Mr. Pig's factory, the commodity he's going to make are chairs. The second part of this process is called consumption. Once Mr. Pig's factory has produced the chairs, he needs to sell it to someone. If he doesn't, then he won't end up with the more money he was dreaming of, just a big pile of chairs. So let's say that Mr. Pig has to spend his money in production in a few basic ways. For easy math, we'll say that for each batch of chairs, he has to spend $100. 50 of that is to get the wood, adhesives, metal fasteners, all the kind of raw materials that the chairs are going to be made of. And then let's say that he needs about $20 per batch for to, you know, the equipment, the tools, the factory, all that sort of thing. It's going to be stretched out over many different batches, right, the expenses, but we'll say it works out to about $20 per batch. He then pays collectively all the people who work in his factory $30 per batch of chairs. Okay, now he then takes this batch of chairs and sells it for $200. There is then $100 extra at the end of the process that you did not have at the beginning. This is called surplus value because it is the extra value you have at the end of the process versus when you started. Well, you might say, duh, that's the whole point of being in business, to make a profit. Way to go, Mr. Pig. But wait, something sort of strange has happened here. Where did this extra $100 in value actually come from? Well, to put it in a short way, it came from the people who built the chairs. They were paid $30 for their collective effort, but they actually increased the value of the chairs versus the raw materials that they started with. They increased, increased this by $130 per batch by putting their labor and effort into producing them. They were just paid only 30 for doing that. So in short, 
This created the increase in value, but they were underpaid for it. Who, however, usually gets to keep this surplus value? Well, often it is the person who organized the production process, which we would usually call the owner. In our case here, Mr. Pig. Then if Mr. Pig takes the money from his sales, in our case $200, and let's say he has to give $50 in taxes, spends $50 on cool pig stuff like a fancy car and as much corn as he can eat, and then takes the remaining $100 and throws it back into production, well, he can just keep this cycle going over and over and over. This money that he has gained through production that he now throws into later rounds of production is called capital, hence the name capitalism that we use for this particular kind of economic system. So how does this whole MCM thing lead to the kinds of inequality that we see today in the world? Well, basically, it comes down to the fact that there are two fundamentally different ways to make money. By owning the operation that's doing the production and then claiming the surplus value that's created every time something's produced, like what Mr. Pig is doing here, or you can make money by laboring for a wage. While in theory, you can make a lot of money and be fairly well off from working if you get a very high wage, it is much, much easier to amass money by not being paid a wage at all, but to instead be the sole owner, or perhaps a part owner of something, such as a shareholder, who is able to claim the surplus value that is created by the production process. It is this claiming and hoarding of surplus value that creates the extensive income inequality we see today. But that inequality in income is the effect of a deeper inequality. The deeper inequality is that some people own productive land and assets, and some people have to labor for someone else who does. Working hard or being skilled may change how high your wages are, but it will never change the underlying way you get paid and it is much easier to amass a fortune through claiming surplus value and controlling the production of others, like Mr. Pig here, as opposed to working for wages, no matter how much you might get paid per hour. Those are some of the reasons we see so much inequality. It's based on the fact that there are different ways to make money, one of which is much more efficient for amassing great wealth for a few while impoverishing the many. This does, however, leave one more important question that we have to answer. What does all this have to do with the fact that men typically have more money than women, or white people in the U.S. have more money than many of the other ethnic groups? To understand this, we have to look back at those moments in history when the land and other productive resources were being claimed by some small subset of the population. When European settler colonists began to make claims that the land and resources of North America should be placed under exclusive privatized ownership, Generally, the claims that were respected and backed up by agents of the government, and which then became the basis for property today, were those of white men over the claims being made by other people who also relied on those resources and whose labor had also improved the productivity of those lands. Even if those lands and resources could in later times in theory be bought by anyone, the original claimants usually got compensated for selling what they initially just took or grossly underpaid for during these early days of colonial dispossession. So are there other ways an economy could be run and organized? Sure. There have been, there are, and there will be others. Capitalism, however, is the most prevalent one we see today, and laws are set up to keep enabling it to function. So while my animal friends and I have explained the basic outlines of how this system works, there are many questions we still need to answer. Like, why is it that this system depends upon and perpetuates the division of human beings into two basic unequal groups, the people who own and get surplus value and those who don't? Second, why did the people being exploited in this process allow it to start? And why do we keep allowing it to happen? Third, if this economic system rewards owners for producing and selling something as much as possible over and over again, what are the environmental implications of this constant need to keep taking raw materials from nature in order to always increase production, regardless of whether the product is even needed? This can't go on forever, because you may have noticed the Earth is finite. Fourth, there is an important contradiction in this way of running an economy. 
Owners desperately want to pay their workers as little as possible, but society-wide, these workers are also your customers, and you want them to be able to buy stuff so you can actually realize your profits. This is a contradiction that can lead to severe economic crises. So in the next video, we'll take a look at what we've learned here and use it to take a hard look at these questions and contradictions. We'll look at why our modern economy keeps almost crashing, what people have tried to do over the past hundred years or so to keep it afloat, as well as look at why so many environmental and social problems are tied to economic overproduction. Videos that follow the next one will start looking at the good news, examining what people are doing now to create different ways of running economies that are more equal, sustainable, and inclusive. See you next time.